Welcome to PALS, it's Professor Anyamu's Anatomy Lecture Series. In today's lecture, we'll be considering internal features of the medulla. If you're watching our video for the first time, if not subscribed, we will encourage you to be part of this great, amazing anatomy family. Here, we make anatomy simple. In this lecture on anatomy of the brainstem, we've already done the first part, this is the second part, and we have a third part. In the third part, we'll be looking at the internal and external features of the pawn. And then in part four, we'll be considering the internal and external features of the midbrain. So let's go to class. The internal structure of the medulla is considered at three levels. What are those three levels? From the lowest level, which is at the level of the pyramidal decussation, and then at the highest level, which is at the level of the olive. Now, between these two levels, we have an intermediate level, which is at the level of sensory decussation. We are going to start from the lowest level, which is at the level of pyramidal decussation. So these are the pyramids, and then these are those crossing fibers. So this is the point of pyramidal decussation, where the fibers from the pyramid cross each other. A section of the medulla at this level has a lot of similarity with a section of the spinal cord. Here we can see the central canal surrounded by the gray matter. Now, if we start from posteriorly, we'll um, see the tract here, which is the fasciculus gracilis. Now, lateral to the fasciculus gracilis, we we'll see the next tract, which is fasciculus cuneatus. And then, if you also follow laterally, we we'll also see the tract of the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve. So, these tracts are seen on the posterior and lateral aspect. Now, if you look, if we look at the gray matter again, we we'll see the masses of gray matter that actually formed the swellings we saw when we looked at the external feature of the medulla in the part one of this video. Here we are seeing the we are seeing the nucleus cuneatus, which are the gray matter that gave the swelling we saw here called the cuneate tubercle and then the gracile tubercle. Medially also we are seeing the nucleus gracilis. Now, if we come laterally, we'll be seeing the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Another important structure to consider as we move laterally is the, sp is the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve. Now, this nucleus is one of the nuclei of the trigeminal nerve, and it has a lot of extension. If we trace it inferiorly, it extends up to the second cervical segment of the spinal cord, and at this point, it will continue as a substantia gelatinosa. Now, when we also trace this nucleus proximally, it actually has a long distance. It also rises up to the level of the upper part of the pons. If we move ventrally, we will consider the remaining structures that can be seen at this level. The very prominent one are the pyramidal fibers, which I've already mentioned. And we noted that we have a number of fibers running here, motor fibers, we have the corticospinal, and then we also have the corticobulbar fibers. A very significant event here, as we noted, is the crossing of these fibers from the pyramid, which is the pyramidal decussation. Now, when we look at the antrolateral surface of the medulla, it actually continued with the antrolateral fibers of the spinal cord. Adjacent to the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve, we see a network of fibers that have scattered nerve cells. These fibers here are called the reticular formation. We will get to the next level, and this level is the level of sensory decussation. The central canal here, the central gray matter, the nucleus gracilis, nucleus cuneatus, and 
the spinal subtrageminal nerve and the pyramid are still seen to be at the same level. We saw them at the level of pyramidal decreasation. But we can notice some slight differences. What are those differences? Now, the nuclei here, the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus, are larger at this higher level. While the tracts, the fasciculus cuneatus, the tract here, fasciculus gracilis, are already getting smaller. When we move behind the pyramids, we will see another structure we are introducing at this level, which is called the medial lemniscus. We will see a decreasation happening around the medial lemniscus. Where are the fibers coming from? We will see fibers from nucleus gracilis and nucleus cunatus crossing to the opposite sides at this point. This is the point of sensory decreasation or medial lemniscus sensory decreasation. Now we have a region lateral to the medial lemniscus. That is the region we noted that has the reticular formation, which is not clear here. We'll get to the third level. And this level is the level of the olive. The section of the medulla at this level of olive is also a section at the level of the floor of the fourth ventricle. It is also a section at the middle of the olive. So both landmarks can be used to trace the, this transverse section. Now we'll go to the central gray matter. We can notice that at this level, we've gotten to the level where we consider the medulla as the open part. In our lecture in part one of this series, we talked about the upper open part of the medulla and then the lower closed part of medulla. Here, the central gray matter has opened into the fourth ventricle. And we can see a number of nuclei spread around the floor of the fourth ventricle. Here is actually the fourth ventricle. And then this is the central gray matter that spread across the floor of the fourth ventricle. From the media to the lateral, we can pick up some of these uh, nuclei. Here we have the nucleus of the 12th cranial nerve, which is the hypoglossal nerve. And then when we also move more laterally, we have them more. The cells are represented more here. That means here is the nucleus for the hypoglossal nerve. Then when we move towards the lateral part, we see the nucleus for the vagus nerve. We see the dosal nucleus of the vagus nerve here. And then when we move more laterally, we see the vestibular nucleus. That is the nucleus that is seen at this point. We will also see more nuclei as we, as we move down. If we move ventral to the vestibular nuclei, this is the vestibular nuclei, we will see the nucleus of tractus solitarius, not shown in this illustration. And then we will also see other nuclei. Here we will see nucleus ambiguous. This is lying within the region of the reticular formation. This nucleus gives origin to motor fibers of the 9th, 10th, and 11th cranial nerves. Now, if we come to the paramedian region, this is the paramedian region. This is the paramedian region. We'll be able to pick out a number of tracts and that are arranged in this paramedian region. What are those? We see the medial longitudinal fiber here. When we move anterior to it, we see the tectospinal tract here. And then if we move more medially, we will see the medial lemniscus. Remember, we met the medial lemniscus at the level of the sensory decussation. Now, if we move anterior to this, we will now see the pyramid. Now, we have the acute nucleus. This is the acute nucleus. The acute nucleus, they are situated anterior and medial to the pyramids. If we move laterally, we'll be seeing two bodies that will be of interest to us. The first one is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. That is the structure here. And then the other one is the inf inferior olivary nucleus. This is one of the swellings we see 
in the anterior surface of the medulla after the swelling of the pyramid. So this is the nuclei of the olive. The picture here gives us a quick summary of some of the structures we have noted in our discussion so far. This is the medial lemniscus, the pyramid, the olive, olive nucleus, nucleus ambiguous, spinal tract of the trigeminal, nucleus of tractus solitarius. This was not noted in the earlier chart we used, but we can see it noted here. And then the 12th cranial nerve and the rest of the nerve. The table here serves as a summary for some of the functions of the components of the medulla. Here we we'll start with nucleus gracilis and cuneatus and they relay conscious proprioceptive sensations to the thalamus. We have the lively nuclei that relay information associated with voluntary muscle movement to the cerebellum. The medulla has a number of vital centers such as the cardiac, the vasomotor and the respiratory centers. We also see a number of nuclei for the cranial nerves and then this nuclei will give fibers to the various um, cranial nerves that they are relaying. The blood supply to the medulla is basically from the vertebral artery that will now give off some of its branches that will give supply to the medulla. Some of those branches are the anterior and posterior spinal arteries, the anterior and posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. As you can notice here, we are seeing the posterior inferior cerebellar artery supplying this particular region of the medulla and then we also see the basilar artery. Now for the clinical correlate, we noted earlier that the medulla contains vital centers and an injury to it is usually fatal. The respiratory center is particularly vulnerable to compression and can result to respiratory failure. We also have what we call the bulbar paralysis and this is characterized by paralysis of muscles supplied by the last four cranial nerves which arise from the medulla. We will now consider some vascular disorders that can be associated with the medulla. The first we will consider here is the lateral medullary syndrome of Wallenberg. The dosolateral part of the medulla is supplied by the postural inferior cerebellar artery which we call pica. This is the region of supply. This is the region of the dosolateral lateral aspect. This artery also supplies the inferior surface of the cerebellum. Now when there is thrombosis of this artery, it will affect this wedge-shaped area of supply on the dosolateral aspect of medulla and also inferior surface of the cerebellum. There are signs and symptoms of lateral medullary syndrome of Wallenberg. Some of those include one Contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation in the trunk and limb due to involvement of the spinothalamic tract. We also have ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation over the face due to involvement of spinal nucleus and tract of trigemina. As you can notice, the structure affected here. That is the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve and its tract too. We also have ipsilateral paralysis of muscles of palate, pharynx, and larynx due to involvement of nucleus ambiguous. We can also notice that we have the nucleus ambiguous around this region of the medulla. We still have ipsilateral ataxia due to involvement of inferior cerebellar peduncle and the cerebellum. So here is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And then we also talked about um, it affecting the lower part of the cerebellum. There is giddiness or dizziness due to involvement of the vestibular nuclei around here. And we can also associate this to Horner's syndrome. This comes as a result of the involvement of the descending sympathetic pathway in the reticular formation, 
which can also be involved in this syndrome. The next vascular disorder we will consider is medial medullary syndrome, also called Dejarin's anterior bulbar syndrome. Now, this is the paramedial aspect of the medulla. This region of the medulla is supplied by the branch of vertebral artery. Now, a vascular involvement such as ischemia of this region can produce a number of signs and symptoms, and some of them include contralateral hemiplegia or paralysis of arm and leg, and this is as a result of the damage to the pyramid. Now we also have ipsilateral paralysis and atrophy of half of the tongue, and this, uh, this is as a result of damage to the hypoglossal nerve. This is the hypoglossal nerve, and then you can notice that the nerve is affected in this degenerate anterior bulbar syndrome. We can also have contralateral loss of position and vibration sense due to damage of the medial lemniscus. And here we're having the medial lemniscus. We have come to the end of this part of the lecture. The remaining part of our lecture has been discussed in subsequent videos. If you find this material helpful, you can share it, like the video, and be a part of PALS Anatomy Family, where we make anatomy simple by subscribing. See you in our next video. Thank you and bye for now.